I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're in our series called I Believe. In the last few weeks, all of us here at this church have learned what the church has believed, and not only what we believe, but we now know why we believe it. And last week, Pastor Brian did a great job of telling us that we should celebrate the ascension of Jesus Christ and that it was important for Jesus to go away so the Holy Spirit would come. It could convict the world of sin. He would empower us to fulfill the Great Commission. But it's also a place for Jesus to go, prepare a place for us so that one day he will come back and bring us to him. And this morning, we're going to look at the next statement of the Apostles' Creed. And today's statement concerns the return of Jesus Christ and the final judgment. Now, how many of you have heard of Arnold Schwarzenegger? You guys ever heard of him? That guy who was so big for no reason, he had big muscles, and one of his classic movies that I enjoyed watching and, and listening to growing, uh, and watching as I was growing up was Terminator 2, Judgment Day. You any, have any of you seen that movie? Okay. Now, if you haven't seen that movie, it's okay. I'm going to kind of fill you in on the details. But uh, here's what the movie is all about. There's a guy named John Connor and his mom, Sarah Connor. And they're trying to stop this future judgment day where there's a battle between humans and robots, these machines. And so the whole movie is geared towards them trying to stop the development of these robots so they can stop Judgment Day. And Arnold Schwarzenegger comes back as one of the Terminators sent to protect John and Sarah to make sure that they continue to live so they can thwart this Judgment Day. And they arrive at this building called Cyberdyne. And they go in there and they, there's a lot of chaos, there's explosions, there's tear gas, and John Connor and his mom, they blow up the Cyberdyne building. And then John, his mom, and the Terminator Arnold, they walk into an elevator, they're in the elevator, and you think like, oh good, they made it, they're going to be safe. But as soon as the elevator goes, ding, and the doors open, you, it pans out to this shot where there's a whole bunch of SWAT team police officers, they're surrounding the building, and it kind of looks like the end, of the, the end of their lives are over. But Arnold, he says his favorite, favorite, I mean, he says one of his most famous lines. He looks back at them and says, stay here, I'll be back. <laughs> and they look at him and they're just like, okay, okay, Arnie, we got you. And I remember watching that like, oh, he is about to bring it. This is about to go down. Arnold Schwarzenegger goes out there, takes care of the police, steals his big old SWAT truck, slams it right through the front of the building, tells them, come on, get inside my truck. And they get inside, they drive off to safety to live one more day to stop Judgment Day. And I look at that, and we can get excited about these fictional heroes. And they, John and Sarah found comfort in Arnold telling them, I'll be back. They're like, oh, good, he's coming back. He's not leaving us. Well, in the same way today, we, if, if fictional people can take comfort in the fact that somebody will be back to rescue them, this morning, Christ's return, we can find comfort in the fact that one day, Jesus Christ will come and rescue us. He'll be back for us to bring us back to him. And not only will he return, there's another part. You see, in the movie, they were trying to stop Judgment Day, to keep it from happening. But from scriptures, we know that we can't stop Judgment Day. That Jesus is coming back to rescue his children, but we will all stand before the throne of Christ to face judgment. And so this morning, we're going to look at this next line, and we're going to put it up here on the screen for you. The next line of the Apostles' Creed states this, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. If you would, read that together with me. It says, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is returning. 
but there's also a judgment for those that are living, for those that are dead. And this morning we're going to examine that. If you would, turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, just like the last few weeks, we're going to be jumping all around through your Bible. Your Bible's going to get a workout. If, you know, if you're having a hard time keeping up and you're like, ah, I can't flip through the pages fast enough, don't worry. Every scripture verse I use is in your notes, and you can go back later and check it out and look at it. But if you want to try to keep up, you can do that. We're going to flip through back and forth all over the place. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says this. It'll be on the screen as well. It says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. If you would, bow your head with me in prayer this morning. Father God, we so desperately need your grace in our lives. God, without you, it says that we can do nothing. Holy Spirit, we ask you to do a work in our lives that you would convict us and you would challenge us to grow in the areas that we're holding on to that don't glorify and honor your holy name. Jesus, we thank you for the shed blood that you gave for us that brought our forgiveness of sins and brings us right back into a relationship with God. And Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are going to return. You're going to gather your children, your beloved, once again. And God, I pray this morning that you would teach us, that you would change us, that you would move us, and that you would empower us to live for you. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. In these short verses, Paul declares a wonderful truth. Jesus is going to return to earth. And he's going to come back to welcome his children back to him. Remember last week, he left to go prepare a place for us. He's going to return in just the same way. But not only will he return, but he will come as the judge for the living and the dead. Then Paul tells us in verse 2, he says, so here, while you're waiting, here's a few things to do. Preach the word of God. Then he says, be prepared, correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. This morning we're going to open up God's word and we're going to see what it says about Jesus's return and the final judgment. And I've broken down this teaching into three parts and the first one is this in your notes. is Jesus is coming back. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Now just a Just a caveat as we look at the return of Christ, okay? There are many theologians, scholars, lay people, just anybody who loves to study the end times, and they love to whip out charts and organization charts and put up eschatological systems and try to figure out when is Jesus going to return. Today's purposes is not, we're not looking at when Jesus will return. This morning we're going to look at what happens when Jesus returns. And just like Pastor Brian mentioned on Wednesday nights, in the future, we're going to be offering theology classes. And if you want to have those debates and have those discussions, there's an opportunity for you to do so. But this morning, we're not getting into the when. We're getting into the what happens when Christ returns. There are three things that Scripture teaches about Jesus' return. And the first one is this. I put it this way in your notes. His return is definite. There's no ifs. There's no maybes. In the Bible, there are over three hundred references to Jesus's return to the day of the Lord of Jesus coming back. There's only 216 chapters in the whole New Testament. So clearly the importance of Jesus's return should be important to us as well as it was to the New Testament writers. In Acts chapter 1 verse 11, uh, at, at Jesus' ascension, you remember that the disciples were standing there, staying up, staring up into heaven and just kind of wondering like, man, Jesus our Savior just left. And the angels stand before them and they make this declaration. Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But, this is the encouraging part, but here's the comfort. But here's what we're waiting for. Someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. John 14, 3, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, look, check this out. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me 
where I am. Jesus' return is definite, and it's comforting to know that Jesus will return, isn't it? It's a comfort to know that when we look at all the wickedness in this world, that one day Jesus will return and rescue us from this wickedness. If you think about it, there are relationships that are broken, are there not? Are there people not suffering and hurting saying, Jesus, please return, rescue me? There are teenagers who have walked away from God and said, I don't care about this anymore. And parents are grieving and crying and praying. And look, that's sorrow. And they're saying, Jesus, please come back. There are fathers who have abandoned their families and their families are left to pick up the pieces. And there's hurt and there's pain and there's sorrow and there's no comfort. And they're saying, Jesus, please return and rescue us. There are Christians who are persecuted for their faith, giving their lives, dying, saying, Jesus, we can't wait for you to come back, because then you'll rescue us. There are women who are being abused physically, emotionally, and sexually, and they're saying, Jesus, please come back, return, save me. And there's criminals who take advantage of others, and there's people saying, man, Jesus, please come back so you can serve justice. The world is filled with grief and sorrow, but thankfully, Jesus Christ will come back and return and rescue and right every wrong that was made in our lives. Amen? But while we wait, Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit to give us grace and hope while we are on this earth, knowing that Christ will one day return and be our rescue. Not only is his return definite, but I put it this way in your notes, his return is unexpected. If I were to say, how many of you know when Jesus is coming back? Somebody might go, oh, I I do. The reality is, is you don't even know. There's nobody that knows when Jesus is going to come back. How do I know that? Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 says this. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Only God the Father knows when Jesus is going to return. So there's been people all over the place that have said, Jesus is going to return in 1950-something, 60-something, 7, 2012. Remember we all thought the world was going to end and we're still here? Nobody knows when Jesus is going to return. His time is unexpected. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. We see that we don't know when Jesus Christ is going to return. And as believers, whether you believe in Jesus Christ or if you're an unbeliever and you have no faith in Jesus Christ, that day is going to come unexpected. But there's another sense in which for unbelievers, it's going to be more unexpected for them than it is for us who believe. You might say, well, what does that mean, Brad? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to look at that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Paul says it this way. He says, now, Concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. Paul says at first that Jesus' coming is going to be unexpected, and he says it's going to come like a thief in the night. When do thieves come? They come at a time you don't expect, because if, they, if you knew when a thief was going to come to your house to rob, This is what you would do. They're going to come at 5 o'clock today, Kelly. Get ready. They open the door. Hey, how's it going? Immediately the thieves are going to go, sorry, wrong house, I'm out of here, peace out. And they're going to leave. If we knew when it's coming, we would be prepared for it. Man, for unbelievers, it says that they're going to be standing there going, hey, everything is awesome. We're partying. Life is good. There ain't no reason to believe in Jesus and live for him. Jesus ain't coming back. We can do whatever we want. And then it says all of a sudden, like a pregnant woman going, I'm going to have my baby. We need to go right now. That's when it says that Jesus is going to come and it's going to surprise them and it's going to shock them and people are going to be panicked like, oh, I didn't know this was going to happen. And so unbelievers are going to be highly surprised. It's going to be highly unexpected. But for believers, 
It will be unexpected for us, but it won't be a surprise. I want you to catch this. In verse 4, if we can go back to verse 4, it says this, But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. In other words, we don't know. But we can watch the signs and the times to know that his return is coming soon. Paul uses the analogy of a pregnant woman. So if we look at that, all of us, we, we've had experience with this. Someone's having a baby, they say, your baby's going to be born on October 30th, which is the best day to be born, in my opinion. Uh, just the best day to be born, October 30th. Uh, but they say, it's going to be born on October 30th. And uh, no matter how many times they watch this baby, you can kind of watch the signs. You see the belly begin to grow, and you're like, ooh. It's coming soon. It's going to happen. And they can do all these predictions, but nobody knows precisely when that baby will be born until it's actually born. In the same way spiritually, Jesus says that we can watch the times. We can see things that happen, the events in the world, to see the progress of what's going on. And we can be aware and know that, yeah, we don't know the exact time, but we know that that time is coming soon. And so when we look at the idea of his return being unexpected, it's unexpected for believers, but it won't catch us by surprise if we're watching and waiting. Here's the the next thing I wrote in your notes. His return is definite, right? His return is is unexpected, and his return is our hope. Would you agree with me this morning that there are many believers who walk around without hope? Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Many believers walk around without hope. Why? Because circumstances and situations have squeezed the hope out of their life. And they begin to see their circumstances bigger than they see their God. And those circumstances become so big that all they see is their struggle and their problem, and they lose hope and forget that there is hope in this world. And because they lose hope in God, they begin to look at, for hope in other places, in other things. They turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, they turn to relationships, they turn to sports, and they turn to these little things in life that give you temporary hope, but never truly satisfy us. But here we see that his return gives us hope. Now, how many of you have ever made a purchase online? Any online purchasers out there? I mean, isn't it fantastic? You don't have to get a parking spot. You don't have to look around for that. You don't have to rub elbows with rude people. And, you know, we went out shopping yesterday, and we went to this one place, and the people were so rude that worked there. It was crazy. We're just, my wife and her, her sister were standing around, and they accused them of wanting to steal something from the store. And it's like, are you kidding? We're just standing there. So there's some rude people that are at stores. And online, hey, guess what? You get to avoid all that. Now, I like to purchase things online. Some of my favorite things to purchase are books, but then, you know, you go through this online experience and you, you click what you want. You're like, yes, I get to buy this. You add it to your cart. Then you hit checkout. And then if you're like me, you check the shipping. Like, hey, I wonder if I could afford the next day's shipping so I can get it as soon as possible. Then you click on that and it's like, oh my gosh, that's $4,000. Okay, I'm not going to pay for that. I'll just get the standard shipping. And so then what happens is as you're waiting for, you know, in my case, if I'm buying shoes and I'm waiting for shoes to come, then every day it's like, I wonder if my shoes came today. And so throughout the day I'm like doing work and then it's like, I wonder if my shoes came today. Then I get excited because I'm going to go home and I'm going to check the mailbox and maybe my shoes will be there. And I go there and I, oh man, my shoes aren't here. Then I go to the next day and I go throughout my day and I'm like, oh, my shoes, they might come in today, and I get excited, and then I go home and I check it, and it's not there, and it's like, okay, it's got to be tomorrow, it's got to be tomorrow. And so we do that until finally we get to the mailbox, and there, when we open it up, the glory of heaven shines up, and our box, the angels rejoice, oh, and we open it up, and there are our shoes, we're like, yes, it's come, and then you like take them out, and you look at it, you're like, those are some, those are some hot shoes right there those are look at that then you tell everybody about it like hey come check out my shoes you like my shoes look at these shoes hey i got shoes today they came in the mail today and so you're excited about it for a moment but then after a while those shoes just get thrown into a closet they get dirty they get messy then you don't even care anymore then you're on to the next thing and see what i'm trying to get at is that we can have hope for a pair of shoes but how much hope can we have when we're looking forward to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
You see, our hope should be on the fact that one day Jesus will return. Forget the shoes, forget the drugs, forget the alcohol, forget the addictions. Focus on Jesus Christ and his return. And that's going to give you true hope in this life so that no matter what happens to you, you know, hey, look, no matter if this is bad or this is a struggle or this is hard, I know one day Jesus will return and rescue me. You see, we have hope for temporary things, but sometimes we have little to no hope for eternal things. Paul gives us the proper hope in Titus chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. He says it this way. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. Check this. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. The believer's hope is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? First thing he says is this, you will be set free from every sin. I want you to think about that. What are the sins that entangle me that one day I can look at that and say, Jesus is going to set me free. I will no longer have to struggle with that. What are the sins that easily entangle you? Check this. You won't have to deal with that anymore. At Christ's return, you hope for it because every sin will, you will be set free from. That's the point of the cross. That's the point of Jesus' coming is to set you free from your sins. And one day, you will not have to battle. You will not have to strive because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so we wait with hope saying, Jesus, we can't wait for you to come because you're going to set me free. You're going to cleanse us. We will finally be your people and be everything that you have created us to be. We will enjoy every spiritual blessing you have waiting for us in heaven. Please come. Come today. Come now, Lord Jesus Christ. We are looking forward to to it you see when he comes there's going to be no more sickness there's going to be no more disease no more cancer none of that second thing I put in your notes is this not only would Jesus come and return for us but believers will stand at the Bema seat of Christ that's kind of a funky word you might be like Bema is that like a BMW seat no it's not Okay, Bema seat, in the original Greek, the word just means judgment seat. And so here's a little cool word for you. You guys know what Bema seat is? It means judgment seat, all right? So there's a little Greek for you. But now, it goes into a little bit more than that. The actual Bema seat referred in the Roman Empire whenever there was athletic competitions going on. There was a raised tribunal platform that was at the games. And that's where the Roman emperor would sit, and he would watch and he would observe the games. And then from this same tribunal seat, when the competitions were over, he would look at the athletes and reward those who have achieved something during those games. And so the Bema seat, this tribunal, was a place of rewards for those athletes who were competing in some kind of game. And Jesus says that believers will stand at the Bema seat of Christ, meaning this will be a place where we will be rewarded for what we have done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat, talking, to, talking about believers, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad. So this is a place for us as believers to stand before Jesus Christ to get rewarded for what we have done, whether good or bad. The next thing I put in your notes is this, is that at the Bema seat, Christ is the judge. Christ is the judge. In Acts chapter 10, verse 42, uh, it says this, and he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all the living and the dead. Now, it is truly important that Jesus Christ is the judge. How many of you believe that there are corrupt judges in the world. Okay, all of us, okay, right? There's a lot of corrupt judges. You have some self-seeking, some that are just rude, some that are obstinate, those that are self-seeking. They don't care about anything else except themselves. And thank God we don't have to stand before one of them. And one of those types of judges is this lady. You might have heard of her. Have you ever heard of Judge Judy? I have a picture of her. 
She's one of the meanest judges I've ever seen. Like, she's so rude. Uh, I'm watch, I just want to give you a couple things. Now, she actually, I'm going to give you a couple things that she said to people standing in her courtroom looking for justice, looking for somebody to treat them fairly. And here she, these people are coming to her paying money to be here, and this is what Judge Judy tells them. The first one, the plaintiff says, he signed me a promissory note. Judy replies, I don't care if he signed the Declaration of Independence. And you're like, okay, Judy, calm down. Then this poor, I don't know if this is a guy or a girl, but this poor soul, Ju Judge Judy says, you spent $72 getting your hair done? You wasted your money. You're like, I'm just trying to, you know, get alimony. What are you doing? Then the next thing that Judge Judy told somebody is, I don't care what you think. I'm the one who has to make a determination of what is fair. You see, thank God that we're standing before Jesus Christ at our judgment and not standing before another human being. Because you see, Jesus Christ will judge each of us fairly. And not only fairly, we as believers, he's gonna, treat, he's gonna judge us out of his grace, he's gonna judge us out of his mercy. It's not gonna be a time where Jesus will ridicule us or condemn us or make fun of us or embarrass us. Jesus is gonna give each of us what we deserve at this judgment. Isn't it comforting to know we stand before him? Romans 2.16 says it this way, and this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Jesus Christ, will judge everyone's secret life. See, Jesus knows everything that we've ever done in our life. He knows exactly why we did what we did. And it's comforting to know that Jesus will be the one that will judge us, because he truly knows us. He truly knows our heart, and his righteousness, his justice will be fair. Next thing in your notes uh, is this, this. This judgment does not determine salvation. And that's comforting to know too. When you stand before Christ, it's not on the basis of, okay, you put your faith in me, but now I'm going to condemn you because you did something wrong. That's not what this judgment is about. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says it this way, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. And then in John 5, 24, Jesus encourages his disciples and he tells you this, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. Isn't that comforting? But they have already passed from death into life. So as a believer, when you stand before Christ, it's not about whether or not you get salvation. You have that through the blood of Jesus Christ. What it is is about what you've done with your life since then and whether you did things that were good or things that were bad. You will never be condemned for your sins. The Bible even goes as far to say is that God has separated your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. And other scripture references says that he will remember your sins no more. So then what's the purpose of this judgment? to reward his servants, to reward his followers, to reward his disciples. And there's two things. Uh, that's the next thing you notice is this. Christ will reward us for what we have done with our lives. He will reward you for what he has done in and through your life. I want you to check these verses out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 11 through 15, it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, then the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the wall of flames. What we've done with our lives once we receive Christ will be the basis for whether, what rewards we receive. And there are two aspects of this rewards in these verses that Paul describes. There's two aspects. There's a negative aspect and there's a positive aspect. The negative aspect is the next thing I put in your notes is that there will be loss. Verse 15 again says, but if the work is burned up, 
the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but it will be someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. You see, some people's work, we as Christians, we struggle with sin, we struggle with pride, we struggle with wrong motives, bad motives, and there's going to be things that we've done in our life where our, basically what God does is takes our works and he's going to put it through the fire, and whatever was not done for his honor, for his glory, gets burned up. And so there's going to be some rewards that we miss out on, and standing before Christ, there's going to be some regret for missed opportunities that we didn't take because we were self-seeking. And we're going to have some regret. We're going to have some shame in the sense that we missed out on a reward. But does that mean that the believers are going to be sad for the rest of their time in heaven? Like, man, I lost some rewards. I, I, I lost some. That just got burned up. And maybe that one person that's described in here who he lost every reward, is he going to be sad and, and be grieving for the rest of time for eternity? No, not at all. Because he's going to be saved, amen? He's going to be with Jesus Christ in the presence of God in heaven and angels. He's going to be rewarded with the fact that he has his joy complete by being in the presence of God. But in a temporary moment, there will be loss. Because later it says that Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes. But we know that we are not always motivated as people by negative things, right? If you try to raise a child or if you've ever been a teacher or trying to do things, the best way to motivate people to do what they should do is through rewards. So there's going to be some that suffer loss, but then there's going to be other part is this. I put in your notes, there will be rewards. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 14, it says, if the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. Believers will be rewarded for the hard work for staying faithful. Those times where you give up going out with certain things and staying true and struggling through things, you're going to be rewarded for that work. When you give in ministry and you serve till your heart hurts, you will be rewarded for that. Jesus said to store up treasures in heaven, not things here on this earth. And so we're going to be rewarded for the good things that we've done for God. And when we stand before him, Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so this... this this judgment for believers is a place of rewards for us. And I want you to catch this. Jesus gave you the grace to place your faith in him. Then he empowers you through his Holy Spirit to do good things for him that he has planned for you. And because you've done what he's asked you to do, he rewards you for it. In other words, everything that we do in our life for God all begins, continues, and ends with Christ's work in our life. There's nothing that we worked up that could we do on our own, and God says, look, even though I started the work in you, and I'm completing it, and I'm going to finish it, I'm still going to reward you for being faithful to me. The old theologian and philosopher, uh, St. Augustine, said it this way, when God rewards us for our labor, he is only crowning his work in us. See, why would God then choose to reward us? Simple. Because he loves you. He loves me. He loves his children. We're his beloved. We're his bride. And because of his love for us, he chooses to reward us when we live for him. And so when we stand there at this throne, it's not a time to say, I'm going to fear and I'm going to be afraid to stand here. No, it's a time where God will reward you for what you've done for living faithfully to him. And then we will turn around in awe and praise and worship and stand at Jesus' feet crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you will be at Jesus' feet to see him in all his glory, in the, f in the face of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will be your ultimate reward, is being in his presence. The next thing I put in your notes is this way. Rewards should be our motivation. Rewards should be our motivation. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says it this way. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Paul says that he's in a race and he's going to live his life in such a way that when he reaches the end of the race, as he fights through and as he lives for Christ, that he will reach the heavenly prize. And another place, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. Then he says this, run to win. What do we run to win for? He says in verse 25, we do it for an eternal prize. 
If we run to win, we receive an eternal prize. I don't know if you ever played sports or anything with somebody or played a game where they just kind of played it and didn't really want to win. And I'm just going to kind of go through this, kind of get through it, and never really strive or achieve anything. Paul says, I don't want you to live like that. I don't want you just to make it, just to get through. Run to win. Run to win to receive Christ's approval for your life. And at some point, some people might ask, well, shouldn't we just live for God because we love him? Yes, we should live for God because we love him. And some might say, but wouldn't living for a reward take away from just living for God? No. No doesn't take away from living for God, because here's why. If you look throughout scriptures, you're going to see that God told Abraham, Abraham, if you, obey, if you obey me, I will make you a great nation. He told Moses, Moses, if you obey me and you trust me, you will lead God's people, Israel, out of Egypt. John 3, 16, it says, for whosoever, uh, it says, in For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, does it say, does it because he said so? No. It says, for whosoever believes in him, what's the motivation? Will not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, there's nothing wrong with having rewards as a motivation, because that's the way that Jesus Christ set it up, saying, look, I will reward you for your faithfulness. You will have my approval for your life if you stay faithful. And the ultimate, the ultimate reward is when we stand before Jesus Christ that he looks at us and, say, and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then it ends like this. Let's celebrate together. Isn't that awesome? Like Jesus says, look, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, let's party because this is awesome. My people are here. My children are here. We're going to party. I'm going to love you, and you're going to love me, and we're going to have things the way that they should have been from the beginning. Not only will believers be judged, but unbelievers will be judged as well. And this leads us to our last point. Unbelievers will stand at the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. They say this, And I saw a great white throne judgment, and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, And death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. These short verses show what happens to unbelievers who reject Christ in this life and then stand before the throne of God. There's three truths that it teaches this, is that Christ's power will be displayed. It mentions in there that they're going to stand before the great white throne. The word great refers to the size and the measure. It means great in its widest sense. So here, unbelievers who rejected Christ will see Christ sitting on a massive throne. It will be undeniable that they are standing before the one true throne king. And not only will they be standing before this massive throne to show that God, Jesus Christ, is king, but it says that there will be, it's a white throne. White refers to brilliance. It's purity, meaning that they will know whatever judgment comes from this throne will be the right judgment, and they will have no case to argue before Jesus Christ. Because you see, the scriptures say that at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, unbelievers who deny and reject Jesus now will one day stand before his throne and utter, you are Lord. But the tragic side of this, it's too late for them 
Recognizing Jesus as Lord at the great, great, great white throne judgment is too late. When unbelievers miss the opportunity to reckon as Lord now, they're going to stand before his throne and it will be too late for them because it says in these scriptures that they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. Here's the second thing that we learn. Every unbeliever will stand before Christ. In verse 12 it says, I saw the dead, both great and small, See, the point is this, whether you were a king, whether you were a slave, whether you had money, whether you were poor, whether you had everything in life or you had nothing in life, if you rejected Christ, everybody's the same at judgment day. Everybody's equal. Those that had riches will not escape from the fire because they were rich or famous or a celebrity. No, everybody will be on the same plane standing before Jesus Christ. Everyone will be there that rejected Jesus Christ. Here's the third thing. The book of life will determine their destination. In Revelation 20, verse 15, it says this, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, people will not be judged upon what good or bad or what they did. They're going to be judged on what if their name was in the book of life. If their name was not in the book of life, their destination is a lake of fire. And you might say, well, how do you get your name in the book of life? What it comes down to is, what did you do with Jesus Christ during your life? Did you accept him and place your faith in him, or did you reject it and place your faith in yourself? Everybody who puts their faith in themselves and chooses to reject Christ will not have their name written in the book of life. And there's going to be people saying, Jesus, look, I did all these great things in your name. And what does Jesus tell them? Apart from me, I never knew you. Your good works cannot save you, will not save you. There's no power in your good works. If there was power in what you could do, Jesus would have never came to the cross. But since we couldn't do anything good for him, Jesus came to die for us so he could place his spirit within us to change us, forgive us, and empower us to live for him. Apart from Jesus Christ, you can do nothing. Without Jesus Christ in your life, your name will not be written in the book of life. And the Bible says there's one tragic destination, the lake of fire and eternity for hell, separated from God. In the scriptures we know that wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And here's the reality, and there are few who find it. See, some people in this world, they reject Christ because they care more about the temporary pleasures rather than the heavenly pleasures. And they choose the earthly success, and they reject Christ and will face judgment in eternity. In the end of these two judgments, at the final closing of it all, you can rest assured that justice will be served. Every wrong will be made right. Everybody that has wronged you, don't worry, they're not getting away with it. No matter if they get away with it their whole entire life, one day they're going to stand before Jesus Christ and God will judge them accordingly. And because of that, we can truly forgive. Because we know that we, it's not up to us to forgive, to exact payment or revenge. It's up to God to do that. And not only that, we should be motivated to live our lives for him so we can receive Christ's approval. I have a little walkaway point at the end to sum it up. I put it this way. You'll see it on the screen. The only way to receive reward and not punishment at the final judgment is to place your faith in Jesus Christ and live for him. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes this morning. Jesus Christ will return. And he will judge believers and unbelievers. So here's a gut check question for us all. Do we know for sure which judgment we're going to stand at? Will we stand at the Bema seat which Jesus Christ will reward us for our faith for him? Or are we going to stand at the great white throne judgment because we rejected Jesus Christ? You see, as long as there is breath in your lungs... There is an opportunity for salvation to come to you. 
if you find your place saying, man, I, I'm afraid that I've rejected Christ and I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ with my sins not forgiven. Today is an opportunity for you to cry out to God and say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me so that I can stand before your throne of rewards at your bema seat and hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. If that's you today and you're saying, I'm not sure, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven or not, man, today make sure you know because this next moment is not promised to you. And when those, those air leaves your lungs and you enter from this place, from this world, into, the, into Jesus' presence, if you don't have Christ in your life, it's too late. So I want to give you an opportunity for those of you that might be in that, that place this morning saying, I want to know how can I get my name written in that book of life? Number one, it's acknowledging that you have messed up, that you've sinned against a holy and just God. And then it's realizing that the only answer is Jesus Christ in your life, that only by placing your faith in him can you be saved. And then it's you crying out to God, confessing to him. If that's you this morning, I want to lead you in a prayer. You might say, well, I don't know what, I'm not sure what to say, and I don't know what God's looking for from my heart. I, I'm going to lead you through a simple prayer. Just repeating the prayer isn't going to make any difference. It's you believing in your heart. The Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you believe that this morning, I'd like to lead you in a word of prayer. Pray a simple prayer like this. Father God, I've sinned against you. God, I know that I need your son, Jesus Christ, in my life. Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. Jesus, I choose to live for you. Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for your sacrifice on that cross. The Bible says when you call upon him in salvation, you will be saved. And the Bible says in that moment, if you trust Christ as your Savior and place your faith in him, that all of heaven rejoices for you, that there is a celebration, there's rejoicing, there's a party going in, on in heaven because you have turned from your sins to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's a party going on for you this morning, if that's you. And man, if you made that decision today, man, our leaders, our pastors, our volunteers, anybody at this church, you find somebody around and say, look, I made a decision to make sure that I stand before Jesus Christ, safe, secured, forgiven, cleansed, and I'm going to be set free. Let us know that so we can celebrate what God has done in your life. For others of us that are believers, I'm just going to give you the simple challenge Paul gave. Run to win. Don't just live this life. R live your life to win the race that God has placed on your life. Each of you have a calling by God to live, to do. And live it out. Run to win. Don't let obstacles tear you down. Stay strong. Keep your hope that Jesus is going to return for you. He will come back to right every wrong in your life, to give you the comfort and the peace and the joy that you're looking for in your life. Run to win. Father God, we stand before you, arms open, hearts broken, Lord God, because we realize that nothing good can come from our lives except for your grace working in our lives. And God, we thank you for that grace. It's so amazing, and we thank you that you chosen to love us, to forgive us, to cleanse us, to heal us, to restore us. And Father God, we just thank you that in, in, in your gracious love that you choose to reward us for our faithfulness to you, even though it's your power and your glory that works within us. And God, we thank you, we believe, and we trust that you will come again. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.